Welcome back in. Hope all of you are having a fantastic Tuesday. You heard the walk-up music, and that means that it is time for Petros Papadakis to join us at the Old P on Twitter. Uh, You can hear him on the Petros and Money Show, AM 570 LA Sports. Uh, All right, I'm kind of curious here. We've got a bunch of stuff to get into with you, but I want to start with uh, the Lakers in the finals and the Dodgers in the Major League Baseball postseason. City of Los Angeles, which one is moving the needle more right now uh, between those two? I saw a Laker flag yesterday on a Which is car. something you don't usually see? Well, that became a thing. That was a thing in the Kobe Shaq Laker days where yes. people started doing the flags and then they'd roll down their windows and it would fly on somebody's windshield and cause, cause an accident. <laughs> the, fly, but, the car flags are a big deal all over the South. We've got those things everywhere for college yeah. football teams. Yeah. Uh, it's a tailgate thing and all that, but it, it became an L.A. freeway thing about, I don't know, 18 years ago. And I saw one today, and I was kind of like, hey, Laker flag, because you don't, you don't really see that stuff very much, and, and there's not really a lot of Dodger flags. The way I see it is this, and this is just my perception of, of what moves the needle for the public, is Chavez Ravine, which is where the Dodgers are going to start against the Brewers on Wednesday and Thursday at least, is a familiar place in this city and to the world of baseball. I mean, the optics in that baseball park, even if there's not fans there, are familiar and comfortable, and watching playoff games there is exactly that. And they have the organist, Dieter Ruhl, who's a great player, pumping in the sound. And it feels like L.A. baseball is what I'm saying. And that's going to go away if they advance. Then baseball goes into its own bubble in Arlington. And I don't really know what that's going to be like at all. But there are going to be some people allowed in there, I I think. And... Then, of course, you have the the bubble in Orlando, which is just not relatable to fans, I think, viewers, in a way. Although the level of basketball is fun and entertaining, and the games have been competitive, I believe. But I think there's more of a disconnect with basketball now. Now, if the Lakers go up 2-0 and everybody starts talking about their parade and there's going to be fanfare and people are going to be told they should be excited, even if they're not. But it's the same thing I tell you all the time. The, the Laker games are more about who's at the game and the surrounding atmosphere. And we've done a great job of turning downtown L.A into a bit of a destination when there is games. I mean, even for hockey people, it's a really fun deal to go to L.A. Live and hang around Staples Center and do that. And obviously none of that's happening happening now. And I think that hampers a lot of the basketball that hasn't really touched baseball in the 60 games that they just finished up. Uh, when you look at the Pac-12 coming back, the Mountain West coming back, what does that say about the decision? What is the vibe that you've heard associated with USC and UCLA and just West Coast football in general? Because uh, in early September, I believe BYU was basically the only school in the Mountain Time Zone or the Pacific Time Zone that was playing a full schedule at all. I think Air Force had a couple of games on their schedule. And now suddenly everybody's come back. But what are you hearing about that decision in the wake of the Big Ten's decision to come back? Well, first of all, I know that the Pac-12 doesn't have a schedule yet, and they haven't even told anybody who's doing their schedule. So it's as murky as always with that conference. Uh, Of course, the MAC is going to beat the Pac-12 back, and so is the Mountain West. (laughs) And so is the Mountain West, yeah, which is uh, you know obviously an indictment of a Power 5 conference because it's not like – the Mountain West or the MAC are some way over-resourced programs compared to the Pac-12, right? No, they just have more of a will to play football. And I think the football world has heard that message loud and clear. I was disgusted last week, really last weekend, I think, when all the shills in the media that write about USC started saying, well, you know, USC was working behind the scenes this whole time. And when the conference lagged, USC took a step forward, which is complete stinking, steaming BS. (laughs) 
it's unbelievable. If you want to come forward and say something, you do it in front of cameras and you make people hear your voice, like Ryan Day, like Scott Frost, like the ADs that wanted to play, like the the, the people that were writing letters, the pre, the, the parents, the, the the university presidents at places like uh, Penn State. I mean, people were livid. We heard zero from USC, and they got criticized for that. And then to throw their hat in the ring and act like they wanted to play, they had the players write a letter on university letterhead and hid behind them like uh, Nino Brown held up that little girl in New Jack City when there was a shooting. (laughs) And, And then all of a sudden, the tide starts to turn and things start to open up a little bit just as far as college football goes on the West Coast. And suddenly there's articles about how USC was forward thinking while uh, while the, the conference lagged uh, and uh, they did it behind the scenes. I mean, who believes that? How can, how, how can the L.A. Times write that article with a straight face? So that kind of stuff has been going on on the West Coast. People scrambling to take credit for something we don't even have a schedule for. And people scrambling to take credit for something a bunch of people have already done, which is either play football or be prepared to play football and have the will to play football. And it's pretty sad. And because, look, you look around college football, K.J. Costello from Santa Margarita High School in Orange County, uh, Bryce Young got in the game for Alabama at a modern day. Uh, you see DJ Uyunglele for Clemson. JT you know, Daniels up, just got, just yeah, got J- cleared. Yeah, I don't think he's going to be the starter unless he is. Uh, that's one of the more bizarre situations that I've watched unfold in, in a long time uh, with JT Daniels and George. If you want some actual West Coast football perspective on a kid that the people of the South haven't really – been able to indict yet i can give it to you but the point is we got southern california football players and coaches and systems all over america going just we don't have high school football or or usc or ucla going at all and you heard chip kelly on dan patrick didn't you yeah a little bit i didn't hear the whole interview i just heard some clips from it well dan was like hey seven games and chip's like yeah you know if we can pull it off i mean look at houston it's like, thanks for the message, Coach. Let's yeah, go get yeah. him. <laughs> yeah. I, I get it, but it's still a lot of people on the West Coast seem scared of what Twitter might say. Yeah. And U- USC and the conference, as always, day late, dollar short. You know what's interesting is, um, as it pertains to that, you were talking about the West Coast. I mean, the biggest West Coast import in SEC football so far has been Mike Leach, and obviously we know the success that he had. I'm sure you've done some of his games over the course of time at oh, Washington I know Mike. State. He's, he's very yeah. close with my dad. I've known him for a long, long time. Done many of his games. Uh, he, you're the fr- he's the first person that took a phone call from Donald Trump that I know in front of me. <laughs> uh, yes, to impress Mark Helfrich, not me, and. Uh, <laughs> I, I look, I've, I know Mike Leach well, uh, and I know his coaching style well, which is why I wouldn't be surprised if they turn around and, and lose in Fayetteville uh, this weekend. Uh, but I the, game's love in, the game's in Starkville. I would be surprised yeah. about that. But we've seen crazy things happen. But the big debate, this was a great sort of parlor room debate, right? Or bar room debate, wherever you are. Parlor room sounds like it's, uh, you know, the 1800s. But if you were sitting around, you'd be like, hey, how would Mike Leach do if he were able to ever play in the SEC? And he's not at the best program, certainly, in the SEC. You can argue he's at maybe the toughest job in, in the SEC. It's up there, Mississippi State is, with Vanderbilt and Kentucky with lots of challenges associated with it. But... As you look at what he did in week one, would you have ever believed that that were going to be possible, that he would go in and have a quarterback throw for over 600 yards, beat the defending national champions on the road? Remember, they didn't have spring practice. We had Mike on the show yesterday. I mean, the performance was just extraordinary and, and electrifying. It never ceases to amaze me, and then it doesn't cease to amaze me when they lose a 30-point lead uh, in a third quarter of a game and lose. Mike Leach doesn't have a concept of time 
for football or just life in general like you or I or most people do. Much of it is his own genius and his talent. He's clearly a great football coach. And I'm not saying that this might not be one of those magic years like he had at Texas Tech with Graham Harrell and, and Crabtree. I remember, look, the, the job at Texas Tech and Washington State, if you look at the conferences, is very similar to the job at Mississippi State. It's a yeah. place where Mike Leach can show up in a sweatsuit. Maybe he hasn't showered. Uh, he can be 15 minutes late. He can talk about the mascots uh, fighting. He can do some confounding things on the football field that work out or don't work out. And everybody's really happy that he's there. Uh, That was the case at Washington State. It should have been the case at Texas Tech. We all know what happened there. And that will be the case at Mississippi State. Now, you put Mike Leach at a school like your alma mater or my alma mater, where he's required to wear a suit and show up at something here and there and, and shake hands with, uh, with big donors and people like that that don't really like the quirky part of him, then it's a little bit of an issue. And that's why he doesn't have a job at those places. But I remember the talk about Mike when he got to Washington State. And people said, well, think of the West Coast quarterbacks he can bring in and the guys that he can develop out of nowhere. And think of the receivers out of a JC that he can get into Washington State without really struggling uh, academically to get him in. And uh, he did do a lot of that stuff, as a matter of fact. You know, think about Gardner Minshew and Luke Falk and uh, a lot of other guys that are on. NFL rosters that have uh, had a lot of success with him. We're talking to Petros Papadakis, AM 570 LA Sports. I don't uh, think he's going to win the conference. That's what I'm saying. But he's yeah, a yeah, remarkable, yeah. great, remarkable football person. There's no and doubt about it. he's going to be an incredible entertainer, which for many programs, I mean, Mississippi State hasn't won the SEC since the 1940s. So it's not like this is a program he went into that's regularly competing for SEC championships. I mean, Dan Mullen obviously won at an incredibly high level. But by and large, this is not a school that, you know, much like Washington State, much like Texas Tech, is expecting every year to win championships. We mentioned a little bit the idea of the Big 12. Big Big 12 has been playing for a while. What did you think about what happened to Oklahoma and what you saw from Texas? Well, I was there last year a couple times, or with that team. I was only there once last year, but with Bill Kleiman, the North Dakota coach uh, who developed Carson Wentz and Easton Stick and yeah. has come down to Kansas State. And the same thing is true. Like You knew that Oklahoma was going to lose a game to Iowa State or Kansas State this year. It happens every single year. Last year, it was Kansas State. I think the year before it was the Cyclones. But that guy can coach. He can coach his ass off, and they compete. I think it was hard for a lot of the Big 12 teams early in the season playing Sunbelt teams that didn't care if there was a crowd there or not because they're used to playing in front of people uh, that really aren't there, uh, very very many people, and it feels scrimmagey for Big time football teams, and it's hard to adjust. The pros are the pros. That's that's why they're pros. They're a little bit more self motivated, but it's hard to rile up a college football team with energy with nobody in the crowd. And I think that I think that affected Iowa State in their opener. I, I know it affected uh, Kansas State in their opener. Not to say anything against those Sun Belt teams; those guys were awesome, and I, I've been enjoying watching that football all year. But you knew those teams were going to bounce back. Those teams are well coached. You know, I mean, Kansas State and Iowa State are well freaking coached. Matt Campbell and Kleiman know how to staff. They know how to coach. Their teams aren't going to give up. When they play Oklahoma, they give it their best shot. And I I wasn't surprised at all. Uh, (laughs) it uh, It was a fun game to watch, and I thought the crew did a great job. Does Oklahoma have a chance, you think? I know it's always kind of difficult to predict, and I've kind of gotten out of the writing somebody off in September, uh, even if they lose a game that you're anticipating that they uh, that they should win. Do they have a chance, you think, to still bounce back, or do you think the Big 12 in general is just going to be so erratic this year, it's going to be hard to have a playoff-caliber team? You know, I, it, it, we need time. But yeah, Texas yeah. is still hanging around, right? Well, I yeah, mean, but they uh, gave up 56 points, and I, and I understand sure. they found a way to win. 
But so did give Mississippi up, State, right? They gave well, up a bunch of points. Yeah, they gave up 34. <laughs> giving up a lot of points now is certainly, you know, used to be defense wins championships. We've kind of given up uh, on, on that argument. It's, it's effectively how good can your offense be um, in, in pretty That's much all levels. Either. Uh, I mean, to a certain the best extent, look at the best teams, and you look. You live in the South. You pride yourself on this. Yeah, the best teams still block people and tackle people, and they start. They win the line of scrimmage. Yes, they start developing through their fronts. And yes, maybe they have bigger guys, and they use our skill people on the West Coast, but the best teams still play tough defense and get stops when they need to and run the ball offensively to help their defense out and have a mindset that isn't just let's score all the points we possibly can. Some of it is, hey, let's keep our defense fresh. Let's have some tricks in the bag for our defense in the fourth quarter if we need to get a stop. That And that exists in the SEC in a profound way, much more than any other conference. And that's important to point out, which makes it very interesting regarding your first question. What is Mike Leach putting up 600 yards, which had never been done before, uh, with K.J. Costello, who's finally, I remember, the gunslinger he was at Stanford and the struggles he had with David Shaw wanted to air it out. And now the, the reins are completely off. I mean, that's an understatement. And it'll be really interesting to see uh, these two things kind of collide in that conference in a, in a very, very stark way with Mike Leach. I think it'll be really cool. Last night, obviously, Monday Night Football, Patrick Mahomes comes out in the first half and just basically says, the NFL is my league. I compared him to Michael Jordan. We keep trying to come up with guys to be his rivals. Who does he remind you of? I know you watched him play in the Big 12 at Texas Tech. Did you ever anticipate that he could be anywhere near this good? And, I mean, how much fun is he just watching play as long as you're not one of the defensive players trying to stop him? The first game, I mean, they were abysmal. At At Tech? Yeah. They, I mean, they were not an impressive football team. Uh, but uh, the first game I did, uh, he was big, bigger than he is now. And uh, he had a big, tough run up the middle or early in the game, and he got tackled and hurt his shoulder, and, and he was out. Uh, and then another game I did up in Ames, he was uh, he was hobbled. He just didn't look good. Uh, he went out there and gave it an effort, and I'm pretty sure he played – Four four quarters, but they got they got blown off the field. So I saw the same stuff everybody else saw. You know, Cliff runs a, a wacky system. This guy has exceptional arm talent. He's a really really interesting athlete, but the lack of footwork was what all the people were kind of complaining about. And it took Andy Reid, who I actually know a little bit through uh, my family, uh, my my. Uncle Jimmy Evangelatus, who also baptized my daughter, was his holder uh, oh, wow. at Marshall at uh, at Glendale Junior College when he was the kicker, and uh, they're still very close to this day. Andy, Andy Reid was Reed, a kicker. And you come on, you've seen all the videos. I've seen the punt pat- like when he was a kid. I didn't know that he was a kicker as a as an adult. Oh yeah, well he played at Marshall High School, which is the same high in Los Feliz where the movie Swingers was based. Oh yeah, yeah. and. Uh, yeah, that's where uh, Leonardo DiCaprio went to high school there. Uh, so he went to Marshall High, the home of the Barristers, Andy Reid. And he went to Glendale Junior College, home of the Vaqueros. And he was the kicker there, and he's in the Glendale Junior College Hall of Fame. And he went in with Jimmy Evangelatus, my uncle, and I was there uh, that night uh, to hang out with both guys. But a- Andy Reid, is, uh, he is a football genius. I know we throw that word around a lot, but he saw some something in that kid uh, and was able to really call plays around him and make him a much more disciplined player in the NFL than he was in college. And, I mean, who does he remind me of? Like, anybody who can elude the rush and create while still looking downfield and find a way not to get hit and really kind of be consistent in that way, because all it takes is one, is – a lot like Mahomes, uh, although he has such exceptional arm talent. I mean, I guess you'd have to say Russell Wilson, who probably throws a better deep ball than Mahomes, probably the best deep ball in the NFL. Uh, Aaron Rodgers is a lot like that, uh, not as fast and probably not as uh, imposing if you try to tackle him if he wants to lower his head, which Mahomes rarely does but can. 
Uh, he really is a one of a kind talent, but it's the it's the being able to look downfield, be creative while eluding people in the pocket. You know, those things combined are are really hard to find. They're once in a lifetime generational type of things. That's why I compared him to start the show to Michael Jordan. You know, it's not that the other guys around Patrick Mahomes, who we keep rising up to try to make his rivals, are are not also supremely talented. But Mahomes now is 3-0 and against Lamar Jackson. And Lamar Jackson's a great, fun, transcendent talent in many ways. But he's just not Patrick Mahomes. And so... Uh, well, he's not the to... same kind of thrower. You know, yeah, the no, no, no him, doubt. Yeah. The threat but, of him yeah. running the ball and hurting you badly with designed runs with lead blockers is something that, that they don't do with Patrick Mahomes. Right. So it's just it's a really different offense to to look at but Mahomes right now looks uh pretty pretty special and if John Madden was still around calling games it would be a slobbering ecstasy <laughs> fest like it was when uh, Brett Favre was doing his thing uh there's no doubt uh Petros Papadakis keep it rolling we'll talk to you uh next week my man enjoy all the California quarterbacks in in the south you we'll enjoy being able to play football, and I hope by the time we talk next week, you guys in the Pac-12 actually have a schedule. I got, I got nothing. Yeah.